You may be seated. Uh, good morning, church. My name's Alex. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, man, what a beautiful story that God wrote in Austin's life. Um, let's go before the Father. Lord, we are so incredibly grateful that we got to hear that story this morning. Just as Austin said, I need Jesus, so do I. Lord, I pray that you would just work in our heart as we study your word and as we walk through Acts chapter 4, Lord, would boldness be ordinary in our lives to continue to point people to you. We love you. It's in your name. Amen. Uh, well, church, uh, for the last several of weeks, we've been walking through the book of Acts, right? And so I just want to give a short recap for us and where we've been and where we're going. Uh, so chapter one, we started the book of Acts and we see Jesus having this conversation uh, with all of the disciples, right? And it's right after the resurrection. He's resurrected from the dead. He's been hanging out with them. He's been eating with them. Uh, and, and he tells them, hey, I need you to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. I need you to go and tell people of what you've seen. I need you to be my witness, to tell them of who I am, to come to save, right? And as they stand there, Jesus ascends, goes up to heaven to the right hand of the Father. And then the two angels, they see uh, the disciples and they say, what are you doing? Quit looking up. Stop worrying about what Jesus, when Jesus is coming back, but go towards the mission that he's sending you on, Right? And so they go and they have to pick the 12th disciple. And so they roll the dice and figure out that God's leading them to choose Matthias. Matthias? Matthias? I don't remember. Uh, but anyway, they go and they select him. And the Lord does something really cool at Pentecost where like a rushing wind and like tongues of fire come upon them to be able to preach and share the gospel in different languages for thousands to be able to hear the truth of who Jesus is. And thousands come to faith in Jesus Christ and come to see that he's their resurrected Lord and Savior. And then right after Pentecost, Jesus and John go to the temple to just pray, right, in chapter 3. And we see there's the lame man who's begging them for alms, and he says, do you have anything for me? Peter and John look to him, and they say, we have nothing, but I give you Jesus, which is everything. And that leads us to the story that we're in today in Acts chapter 4, right? Where after the, they've told the man to get up and walk by a miracle, people are just crowding around, amazed at what God has done in this man's life. The transformation from being able to now walk after being lame for 40 years. And Peter gets an opportunity to share the gospel and proclaim that to everyone around. And so we start in Acts chapter 4 today where they're interrupted by the Jewish leaders, right, who come to them. And I want to give you a roadmap of where we're going so we can track throughout the rest of the sermon. And so first we'll see Peter and John and the lame man, right? And we see that they're arrested because of a bold proclamation that they've made. And right after that, we'll see that the penalty for their boldness is that they have to spend a night in jail and go to court and be just thrown into this trial. And then finally, we're going to see a prayer for more boldness. So, friends, uh, read with me again verses 5 to 12. It says this. On the next day, their rulers and elders and scribes gathered together in Jerusalem with Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, all who were of the high priestly family. And when they uh, had set them in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed? Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you. The builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is no salvation. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. While Peter and John and the lame man are, are sharing the truth, right, to the whole crowd, we see that in verses 1 to 5 of the, of the section. They're, they're preaching and telling the story, and they're amazed at what God has just done. He's healed this lame man, and here come the Jewish leaders, 
They're frustrated and annoyed because they're proclaiming Jesus, right? They're sharing of what God has just done, and they don't like it. And the Sadducees don't like it even more because the Sadducees specifically don't believe in the resurrection. And so they're preaching the resurrection of Christ Jesus. And so that annoys them even more. And so they arrest them in front of this crowd, this great, huge crowd. And they go to jail. They take them to jail that night because the Jewish council only holds uh, court during the daytime. And so they stick them in jail for the night. Can you imagine what jail was like that night, right? You, you kind of see on TV, uh, like people will go to jail and they'll, they'll be in their jail cell and they kind of see each other and they go, oh, what, what are you in for? I just imagine Peter walking into the jail cell and seeing someone who's laying around him and goes, hey, what are you in for? And the guy goes, I parked my camel in the wrong spot. I was working on the Sabbath and they got me. And he goes, oh, what are you in for? Yeah, I was walking to go pray at temple and I told the dude to get up and walk. Uh, okay, what's your friend in for? He's the guy who was lame for 40 years and walked. I just can't fathom what jail would have been like that night. But anyway, uh, they comes to the next morning. And at trial, right, we see the names of different men who were there. And Luke didn't give us this detail for no reason. He gave us this detail for a very specific reason because he lists the names of Annas, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander. Luke is drawing our attention to remember These are the same men who had Jesus killed just a few months ago. These are the same men who said, we want that guy dead. Take him to the cross. And I can't imagine what's going through the hearts of Peter and John and in their minds as they stand before those very men who had their best friend killed. Right? And and as they're standing before them, they ask this question. They say, by what power or by what name did you do this? And this should ring a bell in our minds because Jesus was asked the same exact question. In Luke chapter 20, verse 2, uh, Jesus is proclaiming the gospel, right? He's preaching and uh, people are hearing him. He's performing miracles before the scribes and the elders. And, and they say this to Jesus in Luke chapter 20, verse 2. They say, tell us by what authority you do these things and who is it that gave you this authority? There's a link here that we see, and we know the Jewish leaders don't want to give up their authority, right? They see God himself performing miracles, doing wonderful things here on earth, and they don't want to give up their authority, so they murder him. And now a few months later, the friends of God, right, uh, Peter and John are proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they don't like it because they see that this is doing something. They've seen thousands already come to faith in Jesus after his ascension, and they realize this could lead to us losing some power and some authority. So they, they beg the question to Peter and John. They say, by what authority are you doing this? By what authority was that man healed? Because they know the truth. They know what they're preaching. They know who Jesus is. They just don't want to admit it. And so Peter goes on to tell them. Peter goes on to show them by what power it is that healed this man, right? That Peter's response is an empowerment from the Holy Spirit. Luke keys in and reminds us that he was filled by the Spirit to give this bold proclamation of by what power they did this. And I wonder if while they're being imprisoned and while they're being persecuted and while they're in court, Peter and John are reminded of words that Jesus gave to them. In John 15, Jesus told the disciples, he said, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness. And in this very moment, the empowerment of the, of the Spirit just leads Peter to give this bold proclamation of the truth of who Jesus is. It leads him to remember maybe the persecution that was coming upon him and the Spirit to testify of who Jesus is. 
And that same spirit fills Peter to testify of who Jesus is, to give witness of who Jesus is. And so Peter says to the very men who killed Jesus, he says, when he draws them in, he quickly says, let it be known to all of you that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom raised from the dead by his power, right? By, by his power, this man stood up. And by his power, this man's life was transformed and changed. And by his power, we stand on the cornerstone that built it all. Quickly, Peter turns this trial from his own trial, right? Because he's the one being accused of all of this. And he turns it around and makes it their trial. Because he brings upon an accusation for them. And he starts listing all of these things that they've done. They've murdered Christ, right? Their wrongdoing, their murder trial starts to begin in session in the midst of this. He flips it around and says, you're the one who's crucified Jesus. You're the one who won't give up your authority, that you care about yourself, that you're flying high and mighty, and you don't want to give up that power. You don't want to submit to who God actually is. And Peter goes on to, continue to testify of this Jesus who is crucified and remind them of what they've done. Church, it's easy for us to play the blame game. It's easy for us to say, yeah, those are the wicked people that murdered Jesus. Those are the horrible people who had him crucified. They're the ones. It's their fault. But we stand in the very same spot that the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council, those who murdered Jesus, just as much as it is their murder trial, it is ours as well. Because we've broken our relationship with God. We've chosen to submit to ourselves rather than submitting to Him. We've decided to keep our relationship broken and we're the ones who are put on trial because of our sin. Because we're the ones who also murdered Jesus. Because of our sin, he had to die, and we are just as fault, just as at fault as the Jewish leaders are. So just as Peter gives the accusation to the Sanhedrin, Jesus' death is on our hands as well. Because we've broken our relationship with God. We've sinned against him, and we've decided to live life our own way. We've decided to defy his own law, And we've turned around and said, I don't need you. We've said, we can do it our way. We desire to be our own authority. We desire to lead ourselves. We desire to not submit to anyone else except us. You know, I was studying Romans 1 this week, just in my own quiet time. And at the end of Romans 1, Paul starts to list off this this just crazy list of different sins that are against God. And as I sat there reading it, I said, Jesus, help me. Because this is me. And he goes on to share the list, and he says, it's covetousness, envy, strife, deceit, malicious gossip, slander, boastful, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless people. It's all me. I sat, as I sat there and as I journaled, I was convicted of my sin. Convicted of being disobedient to God and breaking his heart. That trial that Peter puts on for the Sanhedrin, how he flips that, is our very trial. Because of our sin, Christ had to die. And while he took the death sentence, we deserved it. But that's the good news. That's the beautiful news that Jesus died for us. That he took the cross for us. And his name brings salvation. And by his name and his name alone, as Peter says, is the only way we have salvation. By his blood, we are healed. By his wounds, we are healed. 
This is a beautiful truth that we get to just live in. The fact that while the trial is ours, while we deserve death, Jesus took the death so that we could have life. And he joyfully brings us into everlasting life with him. Friends, if you haven't given your life over to Christ, if you haven't actually come to realize the sin that's before you, the sin that's in between you and a holy God, what are you waiting for? By his blood, we could have life. And he paid for our sin, and he paid the death that we deserve to die. But there's good news because he resurrected three days later, and we could have eternal life, and he gives that to us freely. And there's nothing else that could save us outside of Jesus himself. There is no good deed that brings life to us. That there, you can't be good enough to enter into heaven. It's not about being a good person. It's not about working hard. It's not about doing all of these good deeds. But it's about Jesus alone and how he accomplished it all for us. And the free gift that we get to take because he gave it for us. That's the beautiful truth, that nothing but the blood of Jesus is what saves us. And we can trust in him and him alone. No other truth but Christ alone, because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can go to the Father except through him. Peter's bold proclamation to the Sanhedrin, his bold proclamation to the Jewish council, those before him to share the truth, leads us to see something very beautiful as he invites them to see what they've done. And sometimes there is a penalty for boldness. And Peter faced a penalty for that boldness. So friends, let's keep reading. Verses 13 to 17. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated, common men, and they were astonished, and they recognized that they'd been with Jesus. But seeing the man who was healed standing beside them, they had nothing to say in opposition, saying, what shall we do with these men? For that a notable sign has been performed through them is evident to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it but in order that it may spread no further among the people. Let us warn them to speak no more to anyone in this name. When they saw the boldness of Peter, John, and the lame man, they perceived that they were uneducated, common men. Uneducated, common fishermen who had no degree who had uh, no education, right? They couldn't even read. And they perceived that they were ordinary people. Friends, I know that some of us in the room, this is me, it gets a little scary to share the truth of Jesus with others. And, and there's sometimes where Maybe it feels like you don't have all the right answers in the moment where you want to share Jesus with somebody. And you feel ill-equipped. Or you feel like you can't give an answer. Or you don't know exactly what to say or how to phrase it. But here's where the beauty of Acts is. Because it says they were uneducated, common men. Church, the Spirit of God empowers us and fills. I, I got six Bible credits. Like I, I don't have much education either, friends. You can do this. The Spirit of God has filled you and empowered you to go and to share the truth, to be bold, to point people to Jesus, to just tell of what you've seen and what you've heard. It's not about how educated you are. It's not about how much you know your Bible or how much theology you know or knowing all the right answers. But it's about the Holy Spirit moving in your life, prompting you to be bold, saying, I don't care what the penalty is, but I care about this person's soul. And to share the truth of Christ with them, to point them to Jesus. And always remember, verse 8, 
Because verse 8 tells us that Peter was filled with the Spirit, that if you've trusted in Christ, that same Spirit that gave him boldness to go before the council of the Jewish leaders, to proclaim the truth, to share with thousands of people, that same Holy Spirit dwells in you. To continue to go, to be encouraged, to be empowered. And he's the one that does the saving. He's just using us to continue to be faithful to say this person needs Jesus just like I do. They were common men. And that's why Acts is so beautiful. Because God uses ordinary people to do unordinary things. To do beautiful, radical, huge things in the midst of craziness. And he wants to use you. He wants to use you to go to share the truth of Christ with someone. To be empowered by the Spirit. And remember, it's just trusting Him to move. The Scripture tells us, and it goes on to say, they were absolutely astonished by the fact that they were uneducated common men. But he goes on to say that they, were, they recognized that they'd been with Jesus. These regular men who had no degree, who, who had no education, they recognized something different about them. That they'd been with Jesus. That they'd sat with him and they could see that these guys had been with Jesus. They saw there was an actual difference in their life. That they could tell they'd been with the King of Kings. So church, have you been with Jesus? Are you actually pursuing him, to know him, to spend time with him? And is your life noticeably different from spending time with him? Is there a change transformation in your heart while you're spending time with the Lord? Because if you're spending time with him, you'll notice a difference in your life, right? That he will move in your heart and he'll lead you to do things you've never done before and he'll lead you to step away from things that you don't want to step away from. Friends, as we share the truth of Christ with friends, coworkers, neighbors, whoever it is, think of this. Why would they want to hear the gospel from someone who's not even living it? Why would uh, other people want to be excited about some Jesus guy who you're not even excited about? Why, why would uh, they want to have a changed, transformed life if they haven't seen change and transformation in your life? Why, why would they want this Jesus that you talk about if this Jesus looks exactly like their own idols and their own gods? Church, have you been with Jesus? Has he changed you? Has he moved in your heart? Has he led you to continue to walking with him in obedience? Because there is no denial of transformation at all. There is no denial, because as you spend time with Jesus, you'll notice these changes in your life, right? God uses you do something right the more you kind of talk about it because it's on the top of your mind i think about a relationship that you have so my wife right i can talk about my wife left and right i can tell you about her emotions i can tell you about what she's going through i can tell you about what she's thinking i can tell you about her character and who she is all because i spend time with her all because i'm with her and around her And it's the same for our relationship with Jesus because as we spend time with him, whether it's in prayer or studying your Bible or in community, you get to know him a little more. And he changes you. And he transforms you. And there's no denial of that transformation that happens in your life. There's no denial of what God is doing. And just like the Sanhedrin Look at the man who could now walk there. They cannot deny what God has done. They cannot deny the fact that God is so wonderful and so beautiful. And people recognize that in us. And when we change, when something different happens, right? We talk about it. We talk about transformation all the time. Think of like a, a new diet, right? I, I did paleo a couple years back and, 
it was all I could talk about. I was like, yeah, I lost like 10 pounds. It was pretty sweet. No carbs. Or, or the keto diet. Yeah, just loading up on butter. It's pretty great. <laughs> or, or, oh, I got this new app, and my life is so much more efficient because of this app. It's really more inefficient, probably. Friends, we talk about how things are changing our life all of, our, all, all of the time, right? We, we talk about transformation and how transformation happens and, and what is happening in our life because we've started to do something a little different, right? It's the same for when we're spending time with Jesus as he transforms us. Why don't we talk about that? Why don't we celebrate the fact that God's moving in our life? We get to celebrate the story of how Austin is now transformed because Jesus stepped into his heart and he said, I need Jesus. I'm telling you, I'm telling that story. I'm sobbing like a baby over there as I'm hearing of the transformation that God's done. It's absolutely beautiful to be able to talk about that. I, uh, there was someone that used to come to our church and we had a mutual friend and She'd seen the mutual friend, and we're talking, and she goes, oh, I saw so-and-so, and and I was telling them that you're on staff at the church I go to, and while we're talking, I was like, oh, yeah, uh, I, yeah, I remember they probably are just like, that guy works at a church? I knew him in college, like, what? And I was able to share that transformation that God did in my life, not because of some new life hack not because it's a new app or some new diet, but because Jesus stepped into my life and he grabbed me in my sin and he said, you're mine. And he pulled me into everlasting life and I got to say, it's all about Jesus. There's nothing that I did. It wasn't about me making good decisions. It was about God stepping into my life, convicting me of my sin, allowing me to see that I was a sinner in need of saving. And Jesus was that Savior. There is no denial in the transformation that happens in our life. And we could boldly proclaim the transformation that happens, saying, I don't care what the penalty is. Because I'm a common, uneducated, ordinary person who I trust that God's going to use to share the truth of Christ with others. It leads us to continue to believe the truth that Peter says. He says, for we cannot but speak of what we've seen and heard. We cannot but speak of the fruit that God's doing in our life because when he changes us, it leads us to change the way we think, right? We see joy a lot more differently. We see suffering a lot more differently. And we view death a lot more differently because we know that God is coming back. Friends, boldness means speaking in spite of danger or threat. Not caring if there's danger or threat or not caring what's going to happen if you have this conversation with this person because you care so much about their soul. You think Peter and John felt threatened? As they stand before all of the men who just had one of their best friends killed, I bet they felt threatened. But they boldly proclaimed the truth of Jesus to them. And they boldly said, you whom killed Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, he's the cornerstone and he offers salvation to all. So friends, as you share of what you've seen and heard, as you share the truth of Christ and the transformation in your life, not fearing the penalty, would you remember to continue to go and ask for more boldness, more boldness, to continue to proclaim who Jesus is. Keep reading with me, verses 29 to 31. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they prayed the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. So as Peter, John, and the lame man proclaim what God has done, 
they get dismissed because the Jewish council looks and goes, we can't do anything about it. That guy's miraculously healed. So they send him out, and Peter and John go back to their friends, and they start to celebrate about what God's done, and they share the story of what they just went through. And it leads them to pray and to worship God, and in the midst of their prayer, it, it blows me away what they say in verse 29 in their prayer. They say, look upon their threats. So they're talking about the, the enemies of God, right? And, and they say, and grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They literally just escaped death, and they're saying, God, would you give us more boldness? They just escaped spending time in prison, being away from their families, and they say, Jesus, do more. Would you use us all the more to continue to go? Jesus, would we continue to speak your word boldly? This prayer is so rich and wonderful because they could care less about their comfort and they care about the gospel moving forward. It's, like, it's not like they're praying, Lord, would you please just, God, would you just make it so that person's not mad at me after I have this conversation with them? No, they're saying, Lord, would you use this for more? Lord, I'm begging you, regardless if, if they're angry or frustrated or mad at me that I shared the truth of Christ with them, would you use it for your gospel to continue going forward? And would you give me even more boldness to keep going? It's wild to think that these men just escaped prison, escaped near death, faced some of the scariest people and said, God, Give us more boldness to keep going. I don't know about you guys, but I probably would not have asked for more boldness after that. And yet they do. And then God answers their prayer because at the end in verse 31, it says that all were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with all boldness. They continued to speak the word of God with all boldness. So I've got three encouragements for us. Three encouragements for us to take away from this passage. The first is to pray for boldness. Look at the beginning of, of Acts chapter 3, right? One small step of bold obedience to talk to the lame man who's, standing, or who's sitting at the beautiful gate to say, I got nothing, but I'll give you Jesus. That small step of boldness led that man to have new life in Christ, led to thousands hearing the gospel right after that, rejoicing in what God just did, and then led to Peter and John going before the Jewish council to tell of who Jesus is. That small step of boldness led to thousands hearing the truth of Christ crucified. Friends, would we pray for boldness? Last week, Kent gave us the challenge, right? Ask God to, to open a door to give you two gospel conversations this next week. That's what, he, that's what Kent challenged us with. Ask God to do more. Maybe he opened a door and it got scary. And you said, uh, I'll do it next time. I'll wait for the next door. Friends, Pray for boldness that God would give you the courage to share in the midst of that moment. To actually go before those two people. So pray that God would continue to give you boldness to go. Second encouragement, be bold because the resurrection is true. Be bold because the truth of Christ crucified is real. And we know that fact. We know that Jesus did come to this earth, that he did die for sinners, that he raised on the third day, he ascended into heaven, and he reigns and rules over everything right now. Be bold because that is true. Be bold because Jesus is at work. Stand firm because of your faith and say, I'm not ashamed because God is good. And be bold because the resurrection is true. I, I know sometimes it's really easy to be bold on social media, right? It's really easy to put a comment in someone's post who you disagree with. It's really easy to post something and say, yeah, I'm going to be bold and just kind of share this, and it's going to rub people the wrong way. It's really easy to share a link or whatever, 
but sometimes we're not bold in sharing Christ. But friends, we can be bold because the resurrection is true, and it's even more true than just an opinion that you might have. Because it's not an opinion, it's fact. Be bold because the resurrection is true. The third encouragement, be bold out of love. Telling people of Christ is the most loving thing we could ever do. It's the most loving thing that we could ever do because if we truly believe what we believe, we would go to the ends of the earth to tell people about Jesus. Imagine a friend who has an addiction, let's say a drug or alcohol, right? And it's leading them down this path of pain and hurt and potentially could lead to death, right? You wouldn't just let them keep going. You would step in the way and say, you got to stop. Out of love, you would say, this is leading you down a terrible path to death. Friends, how much more loving is it for us to stand and say, man, Jesus is going to give you life. Jesus is giving you more than you could ever ask or imagine. And the way that you're headed, the life that you're headed towards is nothing but death, separation, hell, apart from God. But Christ came for you. Friends, it's the most loving thing we could ever share with somebody. So friends, our three encouragements to take away from this passage is to pray for boldness. To be bold because the resurrection is true. And to be bold out of love because Jesus himself was bold to take our penalty. Jesus himself was bold enough to give up his comfort and to come and die for us. Jesus himself was bold enough to give us life. Let's be bold in response to hope that God saves others. City Light, let's, City Light, let's pray for boldness. Let's be bold because the resurrection is true. And let's be bold out of love. Father, we love you dearly as you love us, God. You love us more than we could ever imagine. Lord, I thank you for the story of Peter and John and the lame man who you healed. And I thank you for just moving in radical, life-changing, transformation ways. Jesus, I thank you that you continue to write beautiful stories as we got to hear of Austin's this morning. I thank you that you use us to share about you with others. Father, I pray that we would be bold in those proclamations. Lord, I pray that we would not fear a penalty, but we would know that we're offering people life with you. Lord, in our hearts, would you remind us to be bold out of love and to be bold because it's true. God, would you give us more courage and more boldness to go? Would you shake this place and change South Lincoln, change Lincoln in general, change the world? Would you save more souls? And would you use us in the midst of it? It's in your beautiful name. Amen.